Um, you have a question? Definitely. Uh, yes. An extremely impressive uh, presentation. I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> um, um, what you could, uh, uh, just speculating as someone have no education in the field whatsoever. But You're too close to the microphone. You need to Hello here? Have you ever um, considered um, uh, working with a large amount of cloned animals? so that you have statistically comparable uh, uh, research specimen and then you raise the clones in exactly controllable conditions. Don't you end up with like similar results that you can um, use in various modes for research purposes? Or So having a, a line of animals that are very, very similar isn't extremely hard. So for example, C. elegans basically has the same setup all the time. Um, the problem is that even with an animal that is the same from specimen to specimen to specimen, right now nobody knows what their brains are supposed to be like. So if I build a model that I claim is a C. elegans or I claim is a mouse, I can't do, I can't prove that in any way except to do behavioral tests and see does it behave externally like this thing. But then, you know, as I pointed out, the most likely case is that you turn the thing on and that there, that, that doesn't do anything. Can that it's basically just, closer? just hello, even closer. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> that that it, it it may act, it may not act at all, or there may be errors that you can't see because nobody really knows what's in a mouse or in a Drosophila. Nobody knows what the brain is supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, you can if you have something to add to that. No, I have a question. A question for Randa, okay, if you want. What, what do you learn from the, uh, um, the, the the brain emulation project, the European uh, uh, brain project, uh, which handed uh, last years? Because so much was uh, awaited at the starting point, it seems to me, and it sounds that uh, how do you say that? Uh, in French, we say "il a accouché d'une souris." Uh, you understand that? <laughs> Yeah, I think I do. So um, I actually thought that the start of the Human Brain Project was really impressive. Um, I like where it came from. I really like the Blue Brain Project. I like a lot of the work they did initially going into it, characterizing so many neurons very carefully. That sort of work I thought was fantastic. And a lot of what has come out of the Human Brain Project in terms of its databases is actually very usable. Um, I really like the models that are there. They're very useful. Um, I think that where things, I, I'm not the expert, you might probably ask Charles because Charles has worked with the Human Brain Project, but um, my take on where it went wrong is more on the organizational side where, uh, because well, partly maybe some people didn't really like, uh, you know, like the heavy handedness of, uh, of um, gosh, Markram, yeah, uh, going into it, but then also of course once you have a flagship program that has a billion euros behind it, then everyone wants to jump on board and have a piece of the pie, and then things get diluted. You don't only see that in the Human Brain Project, you also see that across the pond in the Brain Initiative, where the same sort of thing has happened. And also, when I started my talk and I pointed out that, okay, I, I'm not just going to call this a connectome, I'm going to say nanoscale, morphologically, you know, nanoscale thing, because I wanted to be clear on what we're talking about, because even in that field, just the term connectome got diluted as soon as it, for example, it fell into the hands of people doing MRI. They also make connectomes, but it's a completely different type of connectome. So this dilution tends to happen whenever money is involved, right? So I think that's my take on it, is there's a big organizational issue behind it, but the original intent and the technology and also the models that were built, very useful. So for example, if I want to build good, um, you know, fully known systems, and I want to make them very detailed, I can use models that the Human Brain Project has created to build those things. Very useful. But maybe, you know, Charles, you want to have like a half hour discussion on... <laughs> we can do that right after. Okay. <laughs> okay. We have another question. Hi, yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, this is Nicholas. I have a question for Randall. Um, I don't know if it's an easy question or a hard question, but I was wondering, uh, what do we know about the nature of the human mind in as far as is it a chemical is it purely chemical or is it electrical uh, in other words after a brain has died electrically fully died electrically electrically but not chemically uh, do we still think the mind still exists and can it then 
be revived, copied, uploaded, restored, or is it gone forever? What do we know about that? There are a lot of questions in what you just asked. That's not just a single question. Um, I'll, I'll try to drift maybe a few, and then you can tell me if I missed the most important ones. Uh, so I feel that when I define what I call a mind, to me it's a process more than it is an object or a thing. So for example, I find that my mind is present when my mind is active. If I were in a coma, or if I were, you know, uh, just unconscious or whatever, then, then it, my mind isn't really there in that sense, right? So I'm not really there, but I could come back. I could come back if I become active again. But I'm not there because I'm not experiencing anything, right? I'm not no, no, but really fact, processing the anything. The fact that you can come back, is that because the mind still, even in Well, as I'm saying, to me, mind, mind is, to me, a process more than it is a thing. So it's kind of like driving. A car can be standing still and it can be driving again. Then it's a drive car, a car that has the driving property, sort of like having a mind. So if you can bring it back, sure, the mind, you could say the mind is still there. But, you know, are you sure you can bring it back? That depends on the method you're going to use for bringing it back. And again, there were so many other questions there. I'm sure we can have more conversations over beer and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I have a question. If you were to bring a mind back, um, a mind that was completely clinically dead, um, so the process has stopped at a certain point in time, and at a later point in time the process is restarted would this still be the same person or would it be the same thing as if you had copied it because the new mind that was rebooted would be at a different place in time and space without continuity between them thanks uh, so that question is sometimes seen as a philosophical question or a question that has a lot to do with belief I myself am not a dualist, so I do not believe that there is an external soul that is somehow connected with my mind. I think that my mind is the process that is produced by my brain. So whether I am, whether I was dead and then I was brought back, or I was temporarily dead, let's say you are in deep hypothermia because they're going to do surgery on you for an hour, so they put you under, you know, they cool you down to the point where there's no brain activity at all. This is done to patients. When these patients come back, nobody takes away their house and their spouse and all those things because they all say, yeah, that's still the same person. So right now, at least legally, I don't know if it's philosophically, but legally these are the same people, even though their brain was completely off for maybe an hour. Yeah, yeah, but you know, all I can say is that the law seems to be taking the non-dualist, very materialist approach, which is the same one I'm taking. Randall, I'll save you from these questions that are dealing with consciousness and Parfait's continuity of identity and ask you a very simple question. Okay, you mentioned C. elegance. Let me ask you this. Could you do a whole brain emulation on... Um, the C. elegans, since it doesn't have a brain, could you take the 302 of the neurons and track them to see if they could still, like, take my research a step further and see if the, um, the connection between the neurons are performing the task? Or do, do you have to have a brain since they don't have a brain? For my intents and purposes, it's brain enough because I'm really just talking about neural circuits. Um, I think C. elegance is extraordinarily close. So this is also the reason why Conrad Cording was really positive about this work when we talked about it with him, because he was looking at C. elegance as the maybe not ground truth fully known, but knowable system with a lot of extra work to put in together with Ed Boyden and his lab. They're working very closely together right now to try to get as much information as they can to try to get to where C. elegance would be not just potentially knowable, but fully knowable, really. And in that case, I would say yes, and that would be a good test case. We're maybe not quite there yet. Uh, just just I, I would like to um, add to the previous uh, uh, question. Um, 
because um, I wrote um, that uh, uh, for some people who uh, came back or after a coma or just a, a heavy uh, therapy, uh, or uh, the people around them, or even themselves, uh, were saying, oh, I can't recognize you, or I don't recognize myself. Uh, but yes, the community, uh, we all, uh, uh, decides decide uh, to say no it is the same person so uh, i think that a part of the answer is that uh, an important part of our uh, identity is a collective part uh, and so I, I think yes it's a, it's a part of what we, we we make it possible to have a continuity even if the person in a way in a certain way stop or his conscience stop to function for a while so so i certainly agree with you that part of this is a social concept who we are, who is where our personal selves, so that's also why the law, for example, takes a certain position. Um, whether, I mean, this whole thing about there being people who no longer recognize themselves, I don't know where to go with that because I'm not a clinician and I've not dealt with any of these patients. I'm sure that there are also patients who do feel like themselves after these procedures, and I also think there are probably patients who don't feel like themselves even when they haven't had their brain turned off entirely, but due to other medical conditions. 